might have missed this, but along with the release of Gemini 3, Google researchers set out a research paper to answer this question, is generative UI the future of software? And are we there today? I'm going to ask, is this just marketing hype for Gemini 3 and Google? Or what can we actually learn from this paper? First, I want to show what does this study show? And what are some of the limitations of the study? And is this research valid? And what can we learn from it? What were the Google researchers actually studying? They were studying user preferences for different responses to prompts that they had pre-selected. I'll talk a little bit more about the prompts in a second, but the five types of artifacts that they were creating were a website generated by a human, and they also allowed them to use LLMs. I imagine many of them did. They also had websites generated by an LLM. They considered that generative UI in, by their definition. And then they also had generative markdown from an, N, from an LLM responding to that prompt, as well as generative text. And they showed the top Google search result for that particular prompt. How do they actually construct the study? First, they selected 100 prompts from LLM Arena, and they actually mentioned in the paper that they had to remove eight of them for various reasons. And later in my criticism, I'll talk a little bit more about the prompts and some of the things that I see wrong with them. But I want to show you an example of what the prompts actually were like. One of them was explain fractals, go really in depth. I want to learn everything about it in detail. I'm not sure that many people are actually writing that kind of prompt, but hey, whatever, it works for this paper to compare against. So how do they actually figure out which artifact people preferred? What they did was show the each artifact for that prompt side by side to raters, and then they gave them scores on which they preferred. So let me show you some of the results. So the first result they show is the ELO scores, which you can think of a higher ELO score means higher preference amongst human raters. And at the top of these scores were websites created by the human experts, aided by AI probably, and generative UI, so a UI that was fully generated or a website that was fully generated by an LLM, and in this case, all Gemini models. And then uh, they also compared it to generative markdown, website generative text, and you find that generative markdown actually outperformed the top Google search website. And this probably explains all of the investment in the AI mode in Google and ChatGPT's growth on the market of a better way to find the information people need. And obviously markdown being a much better support than text. Honestly, I don't really know many apps that don't support markdown at this point. So I'm not sure that generative text is really worth comparing against anymore. But uh, let's go a little bit more detail into the actual pairwise comparison. So they also showed you this table where they showed which pairwise comparison won the most often. You know, you can see that the website outperformed text 94% of the time. But what they really tried to highlight in the paper was that the website, although it outperformed generative UI, it only did that 56% of the time. So 44% of the time, generative UI, or in their case, a website fully generated by a model without a human in the loop, outperformed user, or sorry, a human generated website 44% of the time. But I do want to talk a little bit more on my criticisms of, I don't think this is a really great comparison, but I do think that there are some conclusions we can take from this that a more interactive, more visually appealing experience is going to outperform just raw tech. One part of this paper that makes you really feel like it might just be marketing for Gemini 3 is when they actually start talking a little bit more about how they generated the websites and how the different models perform better, both in the pairwise comparison. So Gemini 3 outperformed the in the pairwise comparison compared to all the other previous models they had and had much fewer errors in generating the actual responses. And then uh, this nugget, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about when they compared it to info seeking prompts, which was the majority of the prompts in the data set they used. Uh, it also was much better at generating without uh, errors. And I think there's a reason for that that they probably gloss over a little bit in this paper. But before I talk about my criticisms of this paper, let's talk about the limitations they do actually mention in their paper. So one is generation speed. And the way they got around this is that they only showed the artifacts pre-cached. So all the sites were made by humans, generated by agents, and the chat responses were all pre-cached and then compared the end result. And so there was they weren't really comparing what's the preference when it comes to the speed of generating a full website. And I imagine generating a full website would take much longer than generating just text. And they talk a little bit about ways to make that faster, but that is definitely a limitation of this paper and something to consider with generative UI, probably in general. And then another area they mention is errors. Even though they mention in their model that Gemini 3 had 0% errors or the last two models had no errors, 
I think they also are looking at that limitation a little bit too narrowly, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in my criticisms, but they did mention that there was a risk with generative UI that it could create errors in a way that maybe markdown or text has much less likelihood of ever happening. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about my criticism of the paper, and I'll go through each one individually, and there were quite a few. I think my biggest criticism of the paper is that it was an incredibly small data set, and they really didn't highlight this very much in the paper, that all of the pairwise comparisons only had two human raters for each comparison. I don't think that's enough data to really come to a strong conclusion about what people's preferences were, especially when they were comparing the generative UI or, or let's say fully generated website versus the human created website with the power, with the assistance of AI. And I think that's something that's like probably worth noting and probably should have been put much higher in the paper that, the, that it was a small data set. Another area that I felt could have used more explanation and more clarity were the types of prompts that they selected from LM Arena. So firstly, they didn't actually show all the prompts. They only showed 64 of them and they only showed the information seeking ones. And I think the point, the fact that 64%, so well over half of them were purely information seeking also is a very different experience than a lot of other software products. So some software products, you are not just getting information, but you are maybe also adding information or changing things or sending, sending information to other people. And so there's a lot of other types of generative user experiences that were not covered at all in this paper, or if, if, if at all, very lightly. And I, I, I'm just a little bit I don't think that you can come to really strong conclusions about generative UI from this other than, hey, in some situations, it's possible that a fully generated website could outperform a human created website or the top site on Google or a chat GPT response, for example. But yeah, I think this is a really, really important caveat to this research and probably just tells us we need to have more research. One thing I want to note is also they talk about errors, but they don't really talk a lot about the other types of errors, the errors that are just subtle and maybe aren't going to be found by a linter or a build process. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of that. So this is the site that was generated for that fractals prompt that I showed before. And overall, it's pretty impressive if this was just a one-shotted site by Gemini 3. And overall, it looks really good. But I want to jump to one particular experience where I thought it actually works, but it's not very great. So this particular part of the site, when you first look at it, you think, wow, this is really impressive. But then you run into all these kind of scrolling issues where it turns out when you when you're on this part of it, it it zooms in. But then if but then I can't actually scroll any further unless I move my mouse to this side and then I can scroll. And I imagine that if you did a deep dive into every single one of the sites generated, you would find a lot of small issues like that that might uh, compile, be technically correct, but the actual experience isn't very good. And this is a very, very simple uh, like software thing that's very well known, very well described. And I think it's just worth noting that I think when they said it had zero errors, I think that is probably being very optimistic in defining what an error is. One of the other big criticisms I have is that I think it's a pretty naive comparison when they're comparing the generative or fully generated website to a human generated website. I mentioned a couple of times that they did allow them to use AI. I would imagine they'd have to if they all the contractors created these websites in three to five hours or less. And they were also paying just people on Upwork 100 to $130 per website with not a lot of context. They weren't necessarily like educational experts or people who knew how to, to help answer these problems. I imagine if you did this research again and you you thought of it more of, hey, there are people that have specific skill sets, like maybe education, they would be better at prompting and creating a better website and might significantly outperform a generated, gen fully generated website or the top Google search result or a chat GPT result. So I think that this is a bit of a naive comparison. I think whenever you're making a research like this, you probably have to make some trade-offs and this is a trade-off they took. I think that it probably limits a lot what you can learn from this research. All right, my biggest criticism of the paper is actually what they define as generative UI. And I think you might have noticed through the entire video me make, trying to be more clear about what they were saying is generative UI. And I think the reason is that they created what I think is a false dichotomy of what generative UI is. In their definition, only a website that was fully HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is that a 
generative UI. And then everything else is something less than. So markdown generation or text generation or in their definition, templated UIs are not generative UIs. And I don't agree with this. And I'll give you some really specific reasons why. So I think the biggest reason is that I would consider Wikipedia a user interface, even though it's primarily just text and has very little interactive experiences. And most people just click on links and it's not really all that much different from Markdown. So I would consider that a user interface. And if that's a user interface, I would also consider chat as a type of generative interface, albeit it is more static it's not as dynamic or interactive. It is still, in my opinion, a generative user interface if you would define Wikipedia as an interface, which I think we all would. And then just to drive this point home a little further, if you look at a lot of the sites that it created, for example, the Fractal site, a lot of the actual site was just text with some visual styling. And I wouldn't argue that this is all that much different from just Markdown. Maybe it looks a little bit nicer. It, it can highlight things a bit better. The image helps, but you could get a lot of that with better markdown or markdown with some styling in it. So I just want to point out that I would still consider this a generative experience, albeit maybe not as interactive. And one final point on this is that HTML is by definition a templating language. So there is some limitations to what you can render on a browser versus on a gra on graphics, a graphics card, for example. So I think uh, it's a false dichotomy and I wanna make sure that we're really clear what generative UI is. And I'm gonna give you, I think a slightly better definition of how to think about these types of. So I like to think of generative UI as a continuum. So if you look at the visualization on the left, I would argue that a text-based chat UI is a generative UI, but it's more static, it's more consistent, uh, on, at least on those two dimensions, there's probably more dimensions to think about these generative UIs. A uh, templated UI by their definition, so in, in my the way I define it as components that are registered by a team and the L decides when the components get rendered and what props or data is passed into those components to configure them, to show different elements. Um, I would consider that as, you know, it's more dynamic. You can have more interactive stuff. You can have JavaScript. Uh, it's probably less consistent because the props are changing and, and you, you might not know how the props would perform depending on how the code is written. And then obviously on the far end of it is HTML, JavaScript, CSS, which is, you know, purely dynamic, in, but it, the consistency is probably much less. And then even when you're looking at templated UIs, for example, you could imagine that within that, there's also another continuum of, you know, whether it's just choosing which components to render, maybe the components allow you to change the CSS of the UI, and that would give it maybe more visual control. And so it would have more power Could choose the layout of the site as well. That would also be, you know, more dynamic, but less consistent for sure. Or maybe it can even write some JavaScript in some cases. So I like to think of generative UI as a continuum continuum versus just is the site fully generated by code engine or not. And then one last final definition here. One thing that we're pretty regularly doing is giving LLMs or agents access to tools to gather information, perform actions. And I don't think we would consider that less generative, so to speak. And further to my point, if you actually look at their architecture for generating the UIs, their LLM, Gemini, has access to tools like web search, image generation, and dot, dot, dot of other tools. And it's also using post-processing to make sure that the HTML, CSS, and JSS actually works. And they talk about that a little in the paper. Um, I would just consider having user interfaces or user interface components as tools as not really any different from giving it access to web search or access to APIs to get certain types of information. So my, my point is, I don't think that this is a binary thing where unless you fully generate every experience in your app, then that is not generative UI. I think that you can have generative UI alongside, you know, maybe more traditional types of UIs. And uh, we can talk more about that in another video, but I just wanted to really drive this point home that I don't like how the researchers tried to make this false dichotomy. All right, so what are my final conclusions from reading this paper? I would say it's pretty clear that people generally prefer an interactive experience to static ones, even when they're just trying to get information retrieval or learn something new. And I think that's something that we're gonna see in more AI experiences, probably in AI's Google search as well, or sorry, Google's AI search, as well as ChatGPT.
obviously code generation is getting a lot better and you can see that in this paper and you can see this in all the other stuff that's coming out about Gemini 3 and other models right now, new coding models that have come out in the last few months. So definitely the ability to one shot a good website has improved significantly over the last couple of years. I think also finally that graphical interfaces have a place in AI and we need to start talking about how AI experiences are going to provide visual and interactive experiences alongside just text experiences. And this is maybe one of the first papers that really tried to show the value of that through research. And finally, I think I mentioned a few times in this video is that the research right now is currently pretty limited. I think we need a lot more research about what UI will look like in this new generative world. And I think that these experiences are going to be significantly better than what we're used to today, but there's still a lot to be figured out. And I'd love to find more researchers, maybe ones that aren't backed by any particular model, trying to explore this problem. But uh, I also want to just end with, if you have any questions about this paper or generative UI, you know, please comment below. I'd love to talk to you about it. Or if you found anything in this paper that I missed or got wrong, I'd also love to know about that. And I'll link to the paper below and any other resources that are related to this. And so thank you so much for watching. And I hope that this helped you think a little bit more about generative UI, the benefits of it, and maybe some of the opportunities that are still exist in this space that I'm really excited about.